Hello, everyone. My name is David Hemig. I'm with Matheson, and I'll be your host for this material for this 30 minute webinar. I also want to introduce my colleague, Paulo. He's our Western Region Equipment Specialist. I'm the Eastern Region Equipment Specialist. Also with us is Bill Staples, and you'll hear him at the end when we field the questions that that some of you submitted prior to this webinar. And so Bill will, will join us at that time. Also, as I go through this material, when you find a question that uh, you have, go ahead and submit it to us using the GoToMeeting toolbar function. So, um, uh, and we will field those questions after we finish with the ones submitted prior. All right, so with that, I'll begin the material. Paulo, we'll see you at the end of the show. So, um, thank you. We'll see you later. Welcome okay. to the, uh, the webinar. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. Give me one second here. Okay. All right, we're talking about Matheson Rotometers. And this cover page shows a selection of our products, and we'll we'll be touching on these as we go through the material. Our products are made in the United States of America at our factory in Montgomeryville, Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, all of our specialty gas equipment products are manufactured at our Montgomeryville, Pennsylvania factory. So we're an original manufacturer of rotometers. We have control over the entire product. We buy raw glass. We cut the glass. You can see right here. Here's where we do the cutting. We form the tubes around mandrels. And here are four examples of mandrels. And we choose the mandrel that goes with the rotator that we're going to manufacture. And then that mandrel with the glass tube is put into a furnace. Here's our furnace. And here's some pictures of the tubes around the mandrels in the furnace. This cabinet right here are the controls for our furnace. And then after the tube is created, we're gonna apply the silk screens and the decals to our rotometers. Okay, we assemble and leak test our rotometers, and then we calibrate to NIST standards. And we do that by a flow volume over a set period of time. Here's some of the, a mass flow controller and a Caltrek calibration device. NIST, of course, is the National Institute of Science and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We also clean, prepare, and recalibrate. Your rotometer can last years and have trouble-free service. Some gases are more difficult than others, and maybe you need to clean it. We can do that for you. And then after a decade or so, maybe you want to know that your rotometer still works the way it was originally designed to. We can confirm that for you as well. So what are we going to accomplish today? We're going to identify when a rotometer is needed for your specific application. We'll learn a little about how a rotometer works, or hopefully a lot. We'll learn about features and benefits of rotometers. We'll learn about our capabilities because we're an original manufacturer. And so we, we have the complete depth of rotometer products and we can tie those to your application and then we'll mention some resources we have for you and of course our team Paulo and I and then the engineers and the marketing folks are available to assist you as well
Okay, so you think you need a rotometer. What are the questions you need to ask yourself? Well, first off, the question you ask for any type of gas handling equipment, what is the gas name? That's important. What are the properties of the gas? Is it flammable? Is it toxic to the point where you can't afford your system to allow that gas to get outside of the system? It could be harmful to you or even fatal. Or is it corrosive? If it's corrosive and moisture gets in your system, either by a little bit of moisture in your gas or some ability of, uh, of it to come across a fitting, well, a corrosive gas and moisture is going to tear apart your, your system. And you need to have materials that are going to withstand that. What is your application? Is it more industrial in nature? Are you just feeding a gas to a chamber to blanket your process? Or maybe it's a higher purity application and you're feeding a gas chromatograph or a mass spec. Well, that's gonna go to materials as well. Or maybe you actually make instrumentation and you need to bundle a rotometer into your product. That's common. Are you examples of road meters that are appropriate for that? How important is that gas purity to your point of use? That will determine whether you use brass and buna or stainless steel and viton, or maybe stainless steel and blocks and Teflon, or maybe stainless steel and blocks and calrets. We we suit the materials to your application and the gas you're using, or we match the the materials to your gas and application. How about flow rate accuracy? That's going to determine what type of rotometers you select. Rotometers are plus or minus 5% full scale out of the factory, or plus or minus 10%. And we're going to talk about that further as well. How about the downstream pressure of your application? That, that will dictate where you put your valve. And we'll talk about how a valve is integrated into a rotometer. Also, do you need to control flow or are you just monitoring flow? Again, controlling flow requires a valve. And we'll talk about that in a future slide. Maybe you're gonna put your rotometer on a bench or maybe you're gonna install it in line. The most common is to put it in line. Okay, how does a rotometer work? Well, for one, I handle gas or liquid. Majority of applications are gas. Liquids with, with performance similar to water, well, a rotometer can work for that too, we have that. But primarily, gas is the fluid we deal with. Rotometers work on the variable area principle. Comprises, it's comprised of three elements, a uniformly tapered tube, Here's that taper. This is sort of an example of a rotometer. The float, the float can be several materials. We choose the float based on the performance we need from the float. Tantalum, carboloy, stainless steel, sapphire, glass, all common float materials. Also on your rotometer, you're gonna have a scale. It'll either be direct read, meaning it could be zero to 10 liter per minute for uh, the example I'm going to use here for air, this is a meter per minute air rotometer, or it could use a, core, uh, a sort of a uh, reference chart, and you get the hash mark on your tube, and then correlate that to a flow rate on a reference chart. A rotometer is positioned vertically, and you can see here we have this vertical. The smallest diameter is at the down here, the highest diameter at the top. The gas is going to flow through that room, enter the bottom, come in here, and go out the top. The float's going to rise as the gas comes in. The gas will flow by the float, and eventually the float will stop. So let's say here, the sapphire float. That looks like on a 10 liter per minute rotometer, that's about six liters per minute. If this were a direct read rotometer, you would read that. It'd be six liters per minute air. If it were a 
reference chart type rotameter, we would take that hash mark, go to the reference chart, and see what the flow rate is. And I'll show you that in an upcoming slide. Flow rate corresponds to the flow rate. How do you change the that rotameter? Well, you do that by changing your float, either the material or the size of the float. We can make different types of floats. Or you can change this diameter right here of the tube. And you do that with the mandrels and forming the glass around it. I mentioned that battles set flow rate. So if, if you want to actually determine where that float settles and control your flow to the point of use, say we put a valve down here and we make sure that sapphire float stops here at six liters per minute. The valve sets accuracy is greater at the top of the scale. Remember, rotameters are either plus or minus 5% full scale or 10%. So think about it. A 10 liter per minute rotameter plus or minus 5% accuracy means your accuracy is a half a liter per minute. So if we're operating up here at this glass flow, let's say that's the nine liter per minute, and your accuracy is plus or minus half a liter per minute, that's more useful to you than operating down here at the bottom of the rotameter at say a half a liter per minute point and then having an accuracy of one half a liter per minute. I mean, that's not very useful. So operate near of the scale. Okay, tube pressure is critical. It will determine where we put the valve. If downstream is atmosphere, well, we're going to put the valve in the inlet. We're going to deliver a steady pressure. Could be 20 psig. It could be all the way up to the rating of the rotameter. Our rotameters are rated for uh, a couple of them. Uh, one is 200. Another rotameter can withstand 250 psig inlet pressure. So you deliver a steady pressure that the rotameter can withstand. And then we use this valve to set where that float's gonna be. And knowing downstream pressure is atmospheric, we're gonna get a nice steady pressure. You can't control that downstream pressure. Say there's a back pressure that's changing. Well, we're gonna put the valve on the outlet and we're gonna deliver steady pressure, in this case, 20 PSIG to the rotameter. And we're gonna set that float where we want to uh, where we want it to, to uh, control flow to. Now, it can either be a reference chart, meaning we're going to take this hash mark and go to that chart, which I'm going to show you, or it can be direct read. Typically, direct read tubes are for air, and, uh, and you would use a factor if you're using a gas other than air. For example, hydrogen is roughly uh, 0.25 the weight of air, and so uh, if you're flowing five liters per minute air, you're going to be flowing so you're around 20 liter per minute hydrogen. So there's an example of how the gas will determine how you use the direct read for air rotometer to, to get your flow rate. Okay, here's that reference chart I mentioned. This tube over here is a FM1050. It's got a 150 millimeter scale. You'll see the glass float. Our glass floats are black is sitting at 125. Down here is the stainless. Basically, you read the glass float until it pegs to the top, and then you get the stainless float. And then you get the reference chart for the stainless float. Reference chart is for the glass float. You can see the tube is for air. It's liters per minute. And if we come down here, to, so the uh, 125 is gonna correlate to 7.18 liters per minute air. And that's how you get that reading. And so we have these charts for every gas type. And we can, you basically, depending on the pressure in the scale or in the tube, you can go and get your, your uh, flow rate. This is the rotometers of fortune. And this is how we present our rotometer uh, products and discuss how they tie into your application because we're familiar with ours and it does show the broad range of applications available to you. So let's go to our FM1050. This was used in the reference chart example. This is a nice option for you. 
It's got a nice height. It's got the tube cube feature that I'll talk about. This tube cube can be changed. It's very powerful because you have one rotameter and you just swap out the tube and you can change your application. The scale uh, is 150 millimeter, and then the full scale accuracy is plus or minus 5%. This rotameter, we can actually achieve plus or minus 1% if, 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 if we do the testing to confirm that. You choose the fittings and the seals based on the gas you're using. So inert gases, noble gases, brass would be fine. Maybe SF6, brass is fine. We, we basically look at the material compatibility and, and select the fitting and seals appropriate for you. If you're dealing with a corrosive gas, you need stainless steel, or maybe you wanna guarantee that you don't do anything to the gas to decrease its purity as it gets to the point of use. Stainless steel is a safe play. So stainless and viton, and we choose the seal material based on the gas. Maybe you need a smaller height so you need a rotameter with a smaller vertical dimension. Well, here's our FM1000, extremely popular. You'll see right here, it's got the tube cube feature as well. You can swap out the scale. It's a 65 millimeter length. The accuracy is still very good at plus or minus 5% full scale. We have capacities up to 70 liter per minute air. You'll see, even though it's a smaller height, it actually has, we have tubes, a little more capacity than we do with the FM 1050. This is a direct read tube for air. So whatever you're reading, wherever it is, you're gonna say, okay, that's where it is for air. And if you're using another gas, you're gonna to go to the, the factor and apply that to determine. So again, if we're at two liter per minute air and we're actually flowing hydrogen through this tube, we know it's roughly eight liters per minute hydrogen. Calibrations. We know coming out of the factory that the FM 1050 and FM 1000 rotameters are gonna meet plus or minus 5% full scale. But if you have to have that because your research requires documented that yes, it does plus or minus 5%, we'll test that, we'll confirm that for you. And maybe you need a rotameter to do plus or minus 1% full scale. That's possible too. It takes a little bit of time and some testing and a rotometer can go out the door with that kind of full scale accuracy. The tube cube feature, very powerful. You have your rotometer, you're doing some work and now you like to change what you're doing. Well, how about take an Allen wrench, loosen that seal, that end, pop out the one you've got, put in the new one, tighten it up. You're off and running with a new tube cube. A nice, convenient way to change what you're doing without having to buy a whole nother rotometer assembly. Maybe you have a high flow application. Well, we have that solution for you as well. Here is a rotometer, two heights, one a little over 10 inches, a little shorter, eight inches, roughly the same flow capacity, but that's a lot of flow. So again, use the same air to hydrogen comparison. That's, that's 2000 liter per minute hydrogen capacity, 500 air. We're gonna choose the materials based on the, M, the uh, gas we're using. And then maybe stainless is required because you wanna make sure you have the highest level of purity to your point of use. And maybe the gas has to have stainless. I mentioned in one of the early slides that some people are actually bundling rotometers into their product and then shipping it to the market. Well, we have two types that are appropriate for that, roughly four inches in height. This one, the range is five liters per minute air. Accuracy is plus or minus 10%. So you have to be willing to live with plus or minus half a liter per minute if you're using the full five liter per minute air. This one, a little more capacity, actually a lot, over 10 times. Accuracy is still the same. This is an entirely acrylic rotometer. Like the ones we talked about before, brass, if the gas will deal with that and if that provides sufficient purity to your point of use, or stainless, if you need to use materials to get that gas there without impacting purity or to avoid 
a corrosive gas doing its thing if it encounters moisture. There's a whole other world of mass flow, and that's digital mass flow. A mass flow device with digital can range from two to two to three thousand dollars. The controller for that device is going to be three to four thousand dollars. So, two mass flow devices and a controller, you're approaching eight thousand for that solution. Here, you can flow two gases in. They meet at the top. And they tumble down this mixing brush and out to the point of use. Less than $1,000 for this aluminum end block one with brass fittings. Here's the same thing, not on a base plate with stainless end blocks. It costs a little more. Two gases come up, meet, tumble down, out the back to the point of use. Very cost effective. What if you need three or four gases in your blend? Well, we can do that. Here we are. We've got three coming in, still meeting at the top, tumbling down this mixing brush, going to your point of use. You take an eleven, twelve thousand dollar system, and this is going to be, I don't know, fifteen hundred bucks, depending on whether what materials we use, brass or stainless. Or maybe we get rid of the mixing brush. We put four tubes in this frame, and you'll see these are tube cubes as well. They can be changed. They meet at the top, head to the point of use. We can even put in a module with the mixing brush to agitate the gas and make sure your mix is nice and mixed. So very cost effective. Something like this in stainless, you're in the $2,000 ballpark as opposed to $15,000. So there's how rotometer technology can really save you money and you get a lot of, lot of uh, uh, results from that, good results. You need spare parts. For the most part, your rotometer will work trouble-free for years. But should you need a, a new part? Well, we got them. And then also the new tube. If you'd like to swap out the one you're using and add another one to your portfolio. What if you'd like a nice compact setup? Well, you need to have pressure coming into the rotometer. So let's control it with a dual stage regulator. We talked about this in a prior webinar. A dual stage regulator makes sure you get a steady pressure into your point of use. The two stages ensure that. Okay, so here we've got a nice steady pressure coming into the FM1000 rotometer. We've seen this before. Here is the valve that will actually set the float position within your rotometer setting flow rate, and this is a isolation valve. So here's the one that actually sets what you're controlling. Gas is gonna go that way to your point of use. In this example, it's up to 25 liter per minute. Uh, again, our FM1000 paired with a dual stage regulator. This customer wants to do something very unique. So we met with them and we mapped out what, what their system needs to be. They needed two high flow nitrogen rotometers, actually flow meters, for their facility. And when we brought this drawing back to our engineering group and they produced this beautiful CAD drawing, customer approves it, and here it is right before it ships. Two high flow 1127 rotometers. Remember, capacity up to 500 liter per minute air. So they use one until they need a little more capacity. They bring the other one online. Very nice uh, result, customer was thrilled. And it almost looks like something, it looks like artwork to me, but the, again, I'm biased. All right, <clears throat> how about you've got 12 points of use and they all require a different flow rate. Let's install 12 FM 1050s in this case, side by side with these valves down here to actually set the flow rate for each point of use. And then you can kind of see how one gas comes in on this header, goes to all the inlets, which are down here, and then here are the outlets, flow rate controlled by that valve. Very powerful, this customer in the Southwest is very pleased with this. And we've seen multiple orders because it's so efficient to deliver gas to multiple points of use inexpensively compared to digital mass flow. 
here's a resource. This is really the key thing you need to know. This link, you should go to this link and go to this address or just use this QR, QR code that'll get you there as well. It's got multiple videos showing you how rotometers work. It's got the gas factor document. It's got how to, how to accommodate uh, different uh, pressures and temperatures. It's got that information. No, it's got just about everything you need to know to operate a rotometer. Very powerful link. Just remember that. And again, that QR code will get you there as well. Okay, so what did we accomplish today? We learned how to identify when you might need a rotometer. We talked about how a rotometer works, the variable area principle. We learned about key features and benefits you can get with a rotometer and how you can do pretty accurate flow to your point of use with a rotometer. We, we talked about our capabilities mainly because we have the entire portfolio and we know how each one relates to different applications. So that's why we focused on that. And then I mentioned that link in the prior page. And then of course, Paulo and I, and we are in turn supported by our engineering and marketing folks. We're here to answer your questions and help you with your application. Because we appreciate the fact that you joined us today, we're offering free overnight shipping for you, along with a hat or a bottle if you place your order. This is offer is good through August 31st of this year, and they're good while those they last. I personally love my hat, uh, but other people prefer this water bottle. Okay, so I mentioned in the beginning, we were gonna have some questions and answers with starting off with the questions that you submitted prior to this event. And then um, if you don't see a question that you, uh, you have, go ahead and submit it to us using the GoToMeeting toolbar. So Paulo, go ahead and begin with our, our pre-event questions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, David. I appreciate the uh, follow through. Uh, the first question seen from the audience from Bob is, what is the reason for mul multiple flows within the same flow tube and how do I know which one to read? Uh, thank you, Paulo. Uh, many of our FM 1050 rotometers have both a glass and stainless steel float. This is to extend the range of the rotometer. You'll read the glass float until it goes to the top of the scale and then you'll read the stainless steel float. The next question is, can you create direct read flow tubes for corrosive gas? Uh, yes, uh, we can create direct read scales for corrosive and other gases. There is an extra charge, however, for developing a direct read scale. We do have a rather large collection of direct read scales, so we may be able to find one that suits your applications. Many customers use an FM1050 with a millimeter scale and then use one of our gas-specific reference charts. Thank you, Bill. The next question is from Todd. Is, if accuracy is important to me, should I choose a direct read flow tube or one that uses a correlation chart? Yes, uh, we can make plus or minus 1% full scale reference charts for our FM 1050 rotometers that have millimeter scales. The direct read scales for the FM 1000 and FM 1050 rotometers are plus or minus 5% full scale, if that is an acceptable accuracy. Thank you. Uh, Mike is asking if the float is sticking in the flow tube, can I fix that up? at my facility or should I send it to Matheson for repair? Uh, thank you, Paulo. Uh, flow meters can collect contaminants over time, which can cause the float to stick. Yes, you can send your flow meter back to us for cleaning, as many customers do. If you choose to clean your own flow meter, then you'll have to use solvents that are compatible with the flow meter seal material and the gas that is being used. The next question, thank you, Bill. The next one is from uh, David. How would I go about mounting your rotometer in my panel so it looks seamless? 
Uh, thank you. All of our rotometers are made to be easily surface mounted to the front of the panel. Our rotometers can be bought with a front bezel for ease of mounting in your panels if you want it flush mounted. Thank you, uh, Bill. The, uh, Steve is asking, can I integrate the rotometer models other than your FM1000 into the outlet of the regulator? If I can, is it a single stage or dual stage regulator best for this assembly? Uh, yes, we can offer various regulator flow meter combinations and often get requests for these custom assemblies. A dual stage regulator will give you better control of the flow as the pressure going to the rotometer remains steady over the life of the cylinder. A dual stage regulator with a 0 to 50 psi delivery pressure is best suited for this application. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from the... Uh... Uh, yes, Paula, there are. Um, there's <clears throat> several. Do you have them in front of you or would you like me to go ahead and ask them? Go ahead and ask them, but David, I okay. uh, if you could, please. All right, Bill. Uh, Shiraj Tuckle has this question. Should we see the top of the float or bottom of the float as the reading? Uh, it's a very good question. You read it the, uh, for the spherical ones, you read in the middle of the float. For the FM1127 rotometers, they have like a, a dumbbell float, and there's a little uh, silk screen on there to tell you how to read. Uh, that floor. Thank you. From Ted, is the vertical mounting required to be dead vertical? Can it be pitched five to ten degrees to the back? Uh, our, our instructions say that it has to be within plus or minus degrees of vertical for accurate readings. Thanks, Mike. Shiraj has another question. Can the reading be read electronically? Uh, we don't have uh, apparatus set up to uh, read it electronically. We do have digital mass flow, though, Mil Bill, right? So that's like... Uh, yes, yes, we do have digital mass flow. That's a totally separate topic. Uh, Shiraj has another question. Can you please again tell about having valve at bottom versus top of the rotometer? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it comes up, and I'm not sure everybody really understands it. But it, it, the uh, most people by the rotometers with the valve at the bottom. That's because the uh, application is going to uh, pretty much atmospheric pressure. Sending it to, some people have it to a vacuum source and the valve would be at the top or they have it a pressurized system. Um, the reason why you do that is the, uh, the readings you take are um, dependent upon the pressure. Uh, higher pressure, the gas is compressed you get more flow out of it. So if you're to have varying pressure downstream, the valves on the inlet and the pressure varies downstream, you don't have a, a clear way of finding out what the pressure of the tube is. If you do have varying pressure downstream and you have the valve on the outlet, you can see on your uh, pressure regulator what the, the pressure is going to the rotometer. And you typically would set it to uh, people would set it to 20 or 50 PSI because that's, uh, we have, for the FM 1050s, we have reference charts for 20 and 50 PSI. So it'd be easy to figure out your flow. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bill. And, and again, they can uh, send, I'll have an email address for them if they want to talk about that further. Uh, John Shea has this question. What is the maximum pressure the cube can withstand, the tube cube? The tube cube itself? Yes. Well, the tube cube itself, all by itself, out of not connected in the frame, is not going to hold any pressure at all. Uh, but we have it installed because it's, uh, it's a glass tube in a plastic frame with um, seals on both ends. When it's in the, the rotometer itself, so when the, uh, the tube cube is in the frame, and it can handle 250 PSI, maximum pressure. Okay, thank you. How do you use a reference chart for a multi-component gas mixture? That's Ron. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. And we have, on the gas factor chart, we have a little formula to, to tell you how to um, work it out with mixes. 
So it's basically you're taking a percentage of each. So Bill, they they use a direct read for air and then use that gas factor chart. You would take the different correction factors for each gas, and then it would be a proportional of that. Like if you had a three percent um, methane nitrogen mix, you'd take the uh, methane factor is one point three four two, nitrogen factor is one point oh one seven. So you would take uh, you do a little calculation. It would be 0 0.03 times 1.342 for the methane part of it, and then it would be 0.97 times 1.017 for the nitrogen part of it, part of your gas mix. So the correction factor in total is 1.027. So that that means <laughs> so that means that if you uh, the ball float is at 280 ccm of air then your flow rate and you multiply that factor 1.027 by the 280 and it'll come up to 288 um, standard cubic centimeters a minute. That's for your 3% methane nitrogen mix. Yeah, and that gas factor chart is on that link that I provided. So um, now if they're really lucky, we may have already done a direct read tube for a gas mixture, right? But there's so many mixtures out there. Yeah, we've got a, a large collection of uh, direct read scales for FM1050 and FM1000, and even some for the other other types. So that there's a chance we might have that. Uh, it's more likely for a pure gas and a mixture, but we've done we've done both. So if you ask, we can uh, we can dig through our list and. Okay. <clears throat> Lu Yu Zhang has a question. Uh, this individual is offline at the moment, but it's a good question. If I want to mix two gases, how do you compare using two flow meters versus a proportioner? I think she means two independent rotometers uh, versus a proportioner. Yes, you can do the, the proportioner is really just two flow meters. You have the valves on the outlet, so you can have a steady pressure and then it goes to a mixing tube so you, you can use two rotor meters by yourself I suggest you have the valve on the outlet and then um, that'll make it easier to mix and then you might want to have a mix some kind of mixing uh, tube in there or, or something to mix the gases all right that, good okay Andrew has this question for a sparging application where gas is bubbled through a tank of liquid should I use the control valve at the rotometer outlet or the inlet? Well, you'd have to look at the head pressure of the liquid uh, and how much you're bubbling through. Um, if it's a significant pressure, then you will want to, um, you know, if it's a few PSI of pressure, then you probably want to use the valve on the outlet. Why? Why does your 7300 series two tube mixer only have a glass float instead of both glass and stainless steel? That's from Lu Yuzeng. Oh, huh. yeah. well, it's good for you catching that. We have done it with glass floats, we've done it with stainless steel floats, and we've done it with uh, multiple floats. When we decided to put it on our online store, we wanted to make it uh, easier for people to select, so we chose the I guess we chose the glass float for that, for people to select. But we can um, we can do it for uh, stainless steel floats or uh, both of them in there. Yeah, yeah, she, that's a very good question because it goes to we can customize solutions. We're you know talking about you know the eighty twenty rule. Most of it is demanding what we're putting on our store, but there we can customize systems, right, Bill? Okay. Oh yes, yes. Okay, a couple uh, complimentary uh, comments from the audience, so thank you for that. And again, thanks for joining us, and we hope, we hope this was valuable for you. Thank you very much.